Okay, I've been waiting for this piece for a while. I finally got my hands on it. This is the hot new mini controller for 2020. It's a nice compact form with really heavy wheels. These have big wheels. They have bigger wheels on these than you usually get of controller in this price point. It's the same size wheels you find on a DDJSX. These are six inch wheels, an inch bigger than what you had on the last generation of mixed track. The Pro 3 had a five inch wheel and a colored LED ring around it. So I guess they gave you the inch by removing the LED ring and replacing it with what's in this screen right here. They've given you an indicator ring. You can see as it moves around, it's marking where you are. Then the white circle you've got in there, that's showing you how far you are in the track. You'll see as the white ring spins, it gets closer and closer to come in full circle. I wonder if that's what that saying means. Huh. Now in the sub $250 range, for me right now, this is the king of the little controllers. You get a phenomenally packed little controller. I've seen some talk on the internet where people are wondering, is it worth paying the 50 extra dollars just to have this screen with information that's already on your laptop? It's not really that cut and dry. Right here, you've got the BPMs, and the BPM is a huge display. It's much bigger numbers than what you get on the Serato DJ software screen. <laughs> The elapsed time is also bigger than what you'd see on your Serato screen. Underneath that is the percentage as you move your pitch, and it goes in point tenths of a percentage. Right next to that, you have a very tiny indicator, which is about the size of the one in Serato software. That little thing on the display is actually showing you your pitch range, which is adjustable with this button right here. That's a great added feature right there to be able to control the pitch range. Now you have the ability to go all the way up to plus or minus 50% with the pitch control. I can't think of any other small controller in this range that does that. I could be wrong, but so far all the ones I've tested and played with, they only had the 8%. You also have an indicator for your key lock. That right there for me is just fantastic to have on something this size. So for the amount of information that you're getting on these screens, to me, that alone is worth $50. However, there is an added feature, and that's that you have four deck capabilities with this little controller, even though it has two volume controls, and I'll show you how that works in a minute. Now the pitch control is what you'd expect. It's slightly larger than what's on most controllers. Most controllers end up having a four inch pitch control. This one's four and a half, so dial in your mix just right. Underneath the pitch, you also have the pitch bend. And I like this better than where they had it in the Mix Track Pro 3. They had it up here, was kind of out of the way. This feels more natural to me. Having it down here next to all the buttons instead of reaching over and, you know, moving your road mag clip out of the way. Above the pitch control, you see they have the master volume. They've put it out of the way, which is good. So this way you're not going to be hitting it anytime when you're mixing. It's way out there, and I really like that they put that there. They moved it from here, so that way they can add this effects section. Now I mentioned the four deck capability. In order to get that, you would press what they call the scratch button. This is also kind of like the slip and vinyl mode. If you want to switch modes and get to deck three or deck four on these two decks, you would hit this scratch button. See, there's no indicator, nothing's happening. I am now on track three. And it also corresponds in the software. It shows you this blue rectangle box that highlights the four decks that are on your screen to give you another visual indicator of what's going on, which deck you're on. It can get confusing. If you've loaded a track here and you're not really paying attention, you might start to play that track. If you want to switch over from slip mode to scratch mode or vice versa, you would hold down the shift button and press in the button. And unfortunately, it doesn't give you any kind of indicator that you're in that mode. I feel that Newmark should have added maybe a flashing button. That way you know which mode you're in. 
not having anything there, it kind of defeats the purpose of them having this clear button that has the ability to be lit up from behind like the other buttons. So, I don't know, maybe that saved them four cents a controller. In slip mode, it allows you to nudge the wheel forward and back. You have the entire wheel in order to do nudging, not just the sides. The sides of the wheel have these nice little indentations that fit my fingers just right. What they've done is given you this extra heavy wheel, which spins pretty well. You've got to put a little more force on it if you're scratching, though. But if you're trying to nudge from the side, they've given you this taller platter. So this way your entire finger can fit. You, I can fit most of my fingertip there. It's just, it's just underneath the crease right there. So that's actually impressive to have wheels that tall, this big, and this heavy. And they're pretty precise. Even though I have this little sticker on them, I haven't decided if I want to take that sticker off yet. You know, that's a commitment, folks. That's like dropping down on a knee. You pull that, you peel that off, that means you're committed. I'm not sure if I'm ready to commit yet. I think we're in different places right now. And see, there's no scratching there, just nudging. So this way, if you prefer doing it that way versus the pitch bend, here's the pitch bend. That was plus. And you see it responds immediately when you let it go. That's a nice little touch. Sometimes there's a delay in that in other controllers that have had that. I remember uh, Stanton had that in one of their features, their CD324 had a slight delay, which is now owned by InMusic, which also owns Newmark and Rain. It's like the Disney of the DJ equipment world. You can see the wheel's pretty responsive. Again, I gotta put a little more weight on it than I do with other controllers that tend to have these really light plastic wheels. These feel exactly like the wheels on the bigger controllers. There's no difference here, so that's a nice welcome added touch. It's gonna help you if you're already used to big controllers and you're going out and doing smaller gigs and you want something more compact or you're doing live streams. And right here, we have the always controversial sync button. I mean, come on, people, let it go. It's been 20 years since this technology's been out. And to tell someone they're not a real DJ because of a button, all of a sudden it negates every gig they've ever done, all of their talent, all the money they've made, all the food they've fed their family with. That's all gone now. It's, it's gone because of this. This little thing right here has destroyed their life. They're no longer, they went poof into thin air. <laughs> They dusted like if Thanos snapped his fingers at the DJ Expo. Let me see you do it. Push your DJ and creativity a little further, maybe if you've never even tried it, and you'll see it can be fun when you're doing a transition and you're touching the wheel and you got to touch the pitch and get everything just right. I like the more interactive feel, but I also started when there were turntables. 19, 19, 1985. And the technology just makes what you couldn't do before easily, now you can do it easily right at your fingertips without having MIDI and synthesizers and track machines and ADATs. The sync button is a useful feature for me. It helps with doing transitions, especially live. You want the capability to not have anything go wrong when you're at a gig. And if you're doing a last minute request that's not quite with the beats per minute of your playing, you can actually do a transition, especially now that you have plus 16 and plus or minus 50 percent on the pitch control. Now you really have the ability to do it. Underneath, if you have the cue and play button, there's nothing different there. It's pretty much the same as everything in the segment. It's right where it should be. And I like that Newmark actually kept the decks exactly the same. Where the buttons are here on the left, they're here on this left. I don't like when controllers put the buttons for the left deck on the interior near the faders. I hate that. I absolutely can't stand that. I don't know why they do it. I don't know why they put everything in a mirror image. It drives me bananas. So I'm really appreciative that they kept the decks exactly the same because this is what it would look like if you had two separate turntables. You wouldn't be flipping the turntable around and have your arm on this side and an arm on this side. It would just be ridiculous. So why do it with controllers? For me, that's just a bad design choice. Remember when you're hitting sync, 
the track you're about to play is going to sync with whatever the track is that's playing out into the club right now and all four decks will sync however the four deck mode in this is is weird you see how loud that just got see now i don't have the control I'm actually controlling a different deck. See, that's the weird part right there. When you're scratching, you cut off both decks that you're playing here on whatever side. You have to keep track of all these wheels. It's much easier when you have four separate faders and four separate LED VU meters to let you know which one's playing, which one's not. I know if you want true four deck performance, you should upgrade to one of the four channel controllers because this is just going to throw you off. I think it's more of a ploy in order to get people to say, oh, we have four decks. Now you do have the ability, but that's going to take a lot of practice and time in order to master knowing which deck you're playing right there on the fly. Now that I think about it, I wish they would have kept the LED ring that lights up in a different color when it's a different deck, similar to the Roland DJ-808. Without an indicator, I feel that that four decks is pretty useless because it's just too confusing to use. So now I'm in deck two. It indicates right here which deck you're on. And that's really small too. So having a visual indicator would have been a nice little touch. Maybe it'll be in the mix track Platinum Effects 2. Because if you know anything, Newmark likes to come out with a sequel. Again, it's like the Disney of the DJ world. They have to have a sequel. You only have the ability to mix with a fader portion with the up fader of whatever the deck is that you're on. That's another thing to look out for when you're mixing with these decks. If you use the effects section, it's going to affect both decks, both two and four or one and three. Another reason why the four deck thing I feel is more of a novelty. Sure, you can, but will you really? See, now I have the volume down. It only turned down deck two that I'm on. I would switch over. And you have to move this volume control a little bit. When you go from one deck to the other, the new song is going to go out usually a higher volume. You have to move the up fader just slightly. Some smaller controllers do that with their knobs and effects. When you first turn on your effects, if there's no sound, you have to slightly nudge that wheel and you'll start to get your effect. The cue button does exactly what you'd figure. You can set a cue point. You double tap whichever cue you want. And you hit the cue button and now you've got your cue. Next to this, you also have another welcome feature. This top row of buttons is your pad modes button. You couldn't do that with the Mixtrack Pro 3. You had to hit the shift button and then press the button that said whatever it does on these actual pads. So these pads did multiple things. You have your cue, you have your auto loops. The auto loop feature is nice. It grabs your loop exactly how I expect it to. And to disengage, you hit the loop button that's over here. Over here. <laughs> However, you have these pads set up in your Serato DJ software. Beat-wise, 1 16th beat, half a beat, 1 beat, 4 beat, 16. You can go all the way up to 32 beats and all the way down to a 16th of a beat with these pads. But they'll be in the same position you have them in the software. So if this button is one beat, let's say, and then this one would be two, this one would be four, and then you have eight, and so on. 
And if you switch it in the software, you can have it where this is a 1 16th, this is an eighth, this is a quarter, this is half, this is one, that's two, that's four, and that's eight. Wow, I did like nine takes trying to say that straight. I'm glad I got it. Also a welcome feature on here, they've given you this little loop section right here. You have the loop button. There's also a re-loop button when you hit the shift button. What that's gonna do is go back to your last sample no matter where you are in the song. Just a little sample. So I'm gonna shift and hit reloop. If you wanna change your loop, just press the button again. And just shut it off. Fairly simple, nothing different there from the segment and everywhere else that has that same kind of loop function. Underneath that, these two buttons control your parameters. You can have your effect, you can half the beat of the effect, you can double the beat of the effect. So if you're suddenly doing a four loop and you need to go to an eight beat loop, you would just hit this button. No need for the shift. The shift is gonna control what's underneath that. The secondary feature you have here is for you to set your own manual loops. like this. Now I've got myself a loop going. Was another great thing that I like that they did. It's kind of like a little Easter egg. When you're holding down the shift button and this in or out button, you can actually adjust the point of the end part of your sample and the end of your sample. So I can hold this down, it's in my loop right now, now I can start. I can spin, move the wheel, it's awkward, it is awkward, but you can move this. You can put it wherever you want. And you can do the same with, you could do the same with the out. Next you have the part that's a little weird, something else that's kind of like a fad for this. I feel it's more of a novelty and that's the fader cuts button. That's Newmark's attempt to pretty much do what the Pioneer SB3 was doing with their Jazzy Jeff scratch cuts. What this does is mimic what the movement of the crossfader would be if you were trying to do that scratch. And the scratches they've given you is a one click flare, a two click flare, a three click flare, and a four click thre and a four click flare. Man, I tried to say that one fast, didn't work. Go to Patreon, you'll see the bloopers. And the last one, that, that four, that four click flare is just funny to me that they've named it that because it's always been the crap to me. I've never heard a DJ say, man, I gotta learn how to do that four click flare. Never, 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 never. I've always, it, it, you know, I wanna learn how to do a crab or he's got a nasty crab. <laughs> Memories of high school. Let me show you what I mean. Let me show you this mess. You'll hear what it sounds like. I'm not really a fan, but maybe with practice I can make something of it. I've only had this controller for about two weeks. Here's another problem with this fader cut and something else they need to fix with this controller. The fader cuts button doesn't work if you have reverse crossfader. If you're in hamster mode, the fader, the fader cuts button that's under the deck is supposed to work for that deck. So if you have your crossfader backwards like I do, now I have to come over here and hit the fader cuts on this side to affect that deck, and I have to do the same for that deck. It's ridiculous. All right, so here we go. We're gonna do fader cuts. Let's do a one-click flare. And now the two click. Now we'll do the three click flare.
You can hear how that sounds. It's cutting in and out. You can't really hear it that well. It kind of sounds like when you had a bad CD back in the day. If there was a cut in the CD, and it would be skipping all over as it reached the end of the CD. Now here is the crab. So far what I found with those fader cut buttons is that they actually will go along to the beats per minute. Sometimes with scratch sounds it's difficult to hear, so I'm not 100% sure. Well I guess if you're not 100% sure, you're just unsure. So I'm just saying things to hear my own voice at this point. The last button is your sample button. That's pretty much all your samples that you have set up in your Serato DJ software. The only issue I take with the sampler is that you don't have a dedicated sample volume. However loud your samples are, that's how loud they're going to come out when you're playing your songs. And maybe your sample is louder than the songs that's playing. You'd have to adjust it in the Serato software so you don't drown out the music or your sample's so low it can't be heard. And let me show you what I mean. See how loud that was, and now how low this is. So just be sure to make those adjustments pre-gig. That covers the wheel section. Now we'll go to the mixer section, which is really nice. This actually looks to me very similar to the layout that they have on the Newmark Scratch Mixer, except that the filter buttons were to the side. Now speaking of those filter buttons, they made them huge on here. You definitely know what you're touching if you're in a dark club environment. You won't hit the bass knob and turn your bass down or crank it up. You know that you're on the filter button. So that's a nice little feature and it'll block you from making any mistakes. Right above that, we have the bass, the mid, the highs, and we have the gain control. The Mixtrack Pro 3 didn't have this either. So this is a nice welcome touch if you're a fan of the Mixtrack series. Next to that, we have the normal browse button and you have your load button for left and right. There's a nice little quirk here that I like that they added. If you double tap your buttons, you'll get instant doubles. Let me show you what that sounds like. See how loud that got? Because now you've got double the sound. Underneath, you have the new and much welcomed FX feature. So right here, you have your dry and wet button. You have your beat control button, so your effect can go a 16th of a beat all the way up to an 8 beat. You see, I put it all the way in wet mode, and it's just going to continue on. If you bring your song back without any effects playing, the effect that you had on, especially for reverb and echo, it's still going to be there unless you turn that down. And the beats, I'll just control that really quickly. And there you have it. That's the maximum. Underneath that, they've given you a tap button. This way you can tap your beats per minute. I like that. That's a nice little touch again. Nice little attention to detail. It's way more than I expect on something that costs $250. You have your high pass filter. I like that they've given you the ability to latch your effect or just one hit it. That's all the way down to a 16th of a beat. Now you have your classic flanger sound. Bring it all the way down to 1 16th and you can do some real nice effects. Or if you're really old school, you'd call it the jet like it was on old Pioneer controllers or the first EFX 500. Underneath that, you have the phaser, which is pretty much going to give you what it sounded like when the two songs instant doubled and were playing at the same time. Love, 
Next to that, you have your reverb. That kind of sounds like when you're in the green room before you go on stage if there was a DJ before you. And now you've got your echo, which is my favorite. Now the latch buttons, they're plastic, they look metallic, pretty similar to the Q, play, and sync buttons. They made them look metallic, they're not. They're like a painted plastic. Is this is something you expect if you have the scratch mixer or you have one of the Rain 72, the 70, the Pioneer S9. It's the same feel. Lock it or one hit it. <laughs> Underneath that, you have your headphone controls. Nothing really of note there, other than that they're really small. It's really small, but it gets the job done. And I get the job done. Now you have your Q gain and your Q mix. This is something that I really like that's on top of the controller. Some controllers have it on the front panel, and I don't like that. I really use my headphones all the time. I'm not a no headphones DJ. So when it's on the side here, it throws off my mix when I'm trying to go back and forth and listen to something fast. It just screwed me up. So I really like that that's here. They've put it kind of front and center, right in between the VU meters. They're doing something different. They did away with the green and yellow and red. They put it red and white. <laughs> The faders are pretty much what you'd expect at this price point. There's nothing spectacular. This is no Inno fader, no mag level fader. It's just a normal fader. It's got just the right amount of tension. It's not really tight. It's not really loose. The up faders are actually a little more firm than the cross fader, but that's to be expected. Most controllers do that. Another thing I like that they've done here, they've given you a mic control and they've placed it all the way over here in this corner. Some controllers have put that volume control in the rear, which is really stupid. Sometimes they put the jack in the front and the volume. They actually put the jack in the rear and then they put the volume for it right here in the corner out of the way and able to reach it instead of trying to reach back there, turning it the wrong way. Or you have the front one and it's a quarter inch jack, so the quarter inch is sticking out and you're bumping into it all night. Don't bump the table, I'm trying to mix. Yo, you call that mixing, man? I just helped you out. The rear has about what you'd expect. This has your quarter inch mic input. The USB cable, I like that they added this here, helps with a little bit of RF interference. And your RCA outs, which is to be expected. I have an issue with the USB, and you can probably see that right here. Let me get some light on there. You can see how far that USB is sticking out of the body. It's the same problem that plagued the original version of the new Mark DJ to go to. That sticks out way too far for my taste. It can be moved. Not a fan of that. You have to be really careful with that one. Now I've moved it around. I'm doing it now and nothing's happening, but I feel after repeated use, this thing's gonna get loose and you're gonna have to just throw this thing away. On the front, you have your two headphone jacks and they do work at the same time. It's a quarter inch and an eighth inch. And then just the shape of it, they've given you these chamfered edges right here. Kind of makes it look like there's legs when you look at it from like the sides or the back. So Newmark has gone true to form with this controller versus what they did with the party mix. They actually put their branding here. Newmark is really proud of this controller. They weren't that proud of the party mix, I guess. Which I have a video on that and I'll put the link in the description below. They put their little 45 RPM adapters there. That's something no one's going to notice unless you look underneath or you're somebody like me that really looks out for these little details. This is something no one will notice unless you're someone like me. I did a video before pointing out the controllers, how they have different voltages. The dj to go 2 Touch and the dj to go 2 both need one amp of power. The party mix that has the lights on it and more features needs a half an amp. And now this thing only needs half an amp for all of those features. 
I don't understand why the little mini controllers need so much power. I mean, look at the size of these two in comparison. I mean, look at the difference. But yet, this thing needs twice as much power. I don't get it. Is it worth $249.99? Absolutely. Is it worth the $50 over the mixed track FX? Absolutely. How much use will you get over the extras? Eh. I would say focus on being able to have the screen and all that stuff in front of you versus the four deck thing. Unless you figure it out, then please tag me in your video and I will see you in that one. That way I can learn it. So that's it, everybody. The Newmark Mixed Track Platinum Effects. I'm DJ Chance. I hope you learned something in this video. If you have a comment or ideas for future videos and things that I can review, put it in the comment section below. And hit the like and subscribe. Hit the notification button so you'll know each and every time I do a video every week. And once again, thanks for watching. I appreciate all the love, support, and positivity I've been getting on my channel. Oh, it's been a long night. It's like four in the morning. I've been in here for hours, just messing up take after take, which you could see if you join my Patreon, you'll see all the exclusive content. You'll see blooper reels, behind the scenes things. You can join the Discord chat. The goal is to go out there, master, and make money. Whoa.